Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 13th episode of the Startup Boston podcast. I want to give a big thank you once again to Shay Coakley, founder and CEO at Leanbox, who you can listen to in episode eight for providing me with an introduction to today's guest. And today's guest is Alice Rossiter, founder and CEO of Alice's Table. Alice's Table brings women together to learn new skills and live a social and creative lifestyle through the art of flower arranging. Events are hosted at top restaurants and bars, offering a night out with a twist. Alice's Table works to empower women to create a community that prioritizes living well and working hard. After working at multiple startups, Alice realized that there needed to be a flexible career opportunity for women and set out to start the sustainable option she saw missing. In this episode, a few things that Alice shares are how growing up at the intersection of creativity and business affected her life, what most people misunderstand about the term lifestyle business, the traits of successful event hosts, and how Alice's Table uses metrics to drive decision-making. Also, this week in the book giveaway, I'm giving away a copy of The Power of Habit, Why We Do What We Do in Life and Business by Charles Duhigg. This book is really one of my all-time favorites and has spent over 60 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list. In the book, Charles talks about why habits exist and how they can be changed. The Power of Habit uncovers how the key to exercising regularly, losing weight, being more productive, and achieving success is understanding how habits work. To enter into the giveaway, make sure you subscribe and leave a review of the podcast on iTunes. Enjoy today's episode. Alice, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Absolutely. Glad to be here. Thank you. Alice, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah. So I went to the University of Pennsylvania, um, where I studied visual studies, um, which was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. It was the intersection of art and visual neuroscience. So studying um, not only what we see, but also how we see it and how we experience sight. Um, And then I also minored at Wharton um, in consumer psychology. Um, And after that, I went on to go to the Sotheby's Institute and get my master's in art business. Um, I had every intention of being in the art world Mm -hmm. and kind of joining the art world. And I'm not sure what that meant to me at the time, but that was where I was headed. And uh, went to a number of startups after that um, and kind of learned the whole startup scene and figured out what it meant to be in the ground floor of a company um, and then just, it was time to start my own. So started Alice's Table. So how did you come to found Alice's Table? So I really started to realize that there needed to be a flexible career opportunity um, for women across the country and realized that we keep talking about work-life balance and talking about flexible careers, but there isn't a sustainable option out there. Um, and so I set out to start that sustainable option for people that want to start their own businesses um, and have them be creative and flexible. Yeah, I hear the term work-life balance all the time. What does that yeah. mean to you? Well, to me, work-life balance is really about um, figuring out what you as an individual want it to mean, right? I think we have so many people right now giving us a prescribed vision of what work-life balance should be. And to us at Alice's Table, it's about you deciding. And so that's why we support a community of women that have made a choice. Some of them work really long hours to be event hosts and others decide that they want to host a party once a month. And so for me, it's about supporting whatever choice um, people make within that. So how did you get into flower arranging? Is that something that you're always interested in? Well, I actually worked for a florist in high school and my mom actually just walked right into a flower shop with me one day and said to the woman behind the counter, my daughter's available for work. (laughs) Would you take her? Um, It was very endearing at the time. Not. And I started the next day, but luckily I loved it. So my mom and I are still friends. Um, But it it kind of started a love of flowers. Um, And flower arranging also was the start of Alice's Table because I think it interests women um, across age groups and also demographics. So it was a great place, um, kind of piece of the lifestyle business for us to start with. As a, as a child, you were surrounded by creativity, right? Your mother was an architect Definitely. and an interior designer and your dad was a photographer. 
How did this affect you growing up? And was it you know part of the inspiration that led to Alice's Table? I was that crazy kid that preferred going to my mom's office and sitting in financial meetings to soccer practice. So um, I was always surrounded by kind of this intersection of creativity and business prowess. And so that has completely affected my life kind of growing up from there and understanding that creativity um, and business can kind of go seamlessly together. Um, and so that kind of was the start of Alice's Table to say, how can we make a creative business um, something that is fun and profitable? Why was it important to you to start something that was focused on creativity? I think that the opportunity to crea have creative businesses and creative lifestyle um, is important. And I also want to build a business that many people can participate in that doesn't require a particular skill set, mm -hmm. um, that is a skill set that we can teach and that the vast majority of people are interested in. Um, and so creativity, I think, plays a large role in that. You mentioned before that you wanted to start a, a lifestyle business. Yeah. What do you think most people misunderstand about the term lifestyle business? Yes. So I could go on here for a really long time. <laughs> um, I would say that 80% of the time I say that I've started a lifestyle business, I get this look like, oh, code word for housewife or like, <laughs> you know, small business. I mean, there's just so many things that people think of when they say, when you say a lifestyle business. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think what they fail to realize is that actually, women and mothers have the largest buying power of households in the U.S., and they're making lifestyle choices time and time again. So there shouldn't be this kind of stigma around a lifestyle business. Um, I think it just means that we're putting brand first. Tell us more about uh, what Alice's Table is. Um, so at Alice's Table, we've built a platform um, for women to launch their own businesses. So we've built a platform that not only trains them, but also manages the life cycle of their events. So we train them to teach flower arranging classes in their communities, whether those classes are public events where they teach classes at bars and restaurants or corporate team building, private events, kind of you name it. Mm -hmm. um, but the fundamental piece is that we're building a platform for people to start their own businesses and really grow in their community. I also kind of always bring up that the traditional option is you're either in direct sales or you have a job. And we like to say that we're kind of the entrepreneur's solution where you're not just pushing um, jewelry or face cream or something like that. You actually have a skill to teach mm -hmm. and a marketable um, business mm -hmm. to go out to the world with. So if someone's interested in attending one of your classes, what can they, what can they expect to learn? When someone attends an event, they arrive and they learn to make a beautiful flower arrangement. Um, and we give them all the tools that they need with lots of tips and tricks along the way of how to keep their flower arrangements alive um, and kind of different interesting facts about flowers. And then they get to go home with the arrangement in a vase. Okay. And how much, how much does that cost? Um, so it's $65 a ticket is our okay. standard ticket. Um, and that is kind of the traditional experience. But we do lots of partnerships and other things um, where the ticket price may change. Hmm. How many event hosts do you have now? Uh, so we currently, we launched about a month ago. Okay. Um, we had beta before that with one host. And now we're excited to have 10 hosts across three states, wow. um, which is, you know, a little crazy. We're not quite <laughs> sure how to handle it. Um, but we have had one host that has been extremely successful, kind of that set out with beta. Um, so we opened it up. Awesome. Yeah. Why, why should someone become an event host if they're thinking about it? I think that becoming an event host is really a personal decision, um, and we encourage people to kind of take time to think about it. Um, it's committing to starting your own business and committing to launching um, a unique career, but someone should become a host that is excited about being an entrepreneur but wants the support system of a corporate office. So we provide the platform. We provide lots of support. We do all the invoicing and contracting and things for um, our hosts, okay. but really provide that platform to get them off to the races and start a successful business. Hmm. That way they just have to focus on running the events themselves and not all that stuff that goes on in the background. Yep. So they focus on running the events, but they're also focusing on um, prospecting and marketing of their events. So... 
um, you know, going out to their local um, or their husband's company or their um, local salon that might want to do a partnered event. So really kind of driving the train on what different opportunities for events are, different partnerships, mm -hmm. um, maybe their friend down the street's having a birthday party, um, and just figuring out how to grow their business within their community. Are there any characteristics that you think a successful event host possesses? Successful event hosts, hosts definitely are good networkers. Um, they're also outgoing and willing to stand in front of a crowd. Um, and then finally, I think they have a can-do attitude. Um, event, being an event host is not an easy job. You do have to, you know, slug buckets in and out of the car and you're carrying lots of heavy stuff. So it's, it's someone that's passionate about what they do and, and creative and enjoys being a hostess. You mentioned that you have uh, one person that's been very successful so far, right? With your yep. beta test. Um, can you tell us about, you know, how that, how that change has affected her and what, what she's been able to do? Um, she started two months ago now and we started with just one host. I was the host um, for the first kind of seven or eight months of our business. And then we opened it up to others, um, to one more and now to the rest. But um, she had hosted five successful events in her first month with um, 20 people at each, which is about 300% greater than we <laughs> expected her to do, um, which I don't think can be seen as a model for the future, but is certainly something that um, we're excited about. And the rest of our hosts are in the training pipeline now. So we're just about to see how they grow. Yeah. So we're excited. On, on your website, right, it says that one of your missions is to empower other women to create a community that prioritizes living well and working hard. Can you talk about why that's important to you and what it means to you to have the ability to do that? So for us, a community that prioritizes living well and working hard really goes back to that work-life balance question. And allowing people to have the career or life that they choose and not prescribing um, the right solution. So I think it's very interesting, all of the conversation that's been going on right now, um, or for the past many years about women in the workforce and work-life balance and, you know, can women have it all, you know, like, can you have a family and have a career? Um, and, you know, even looking at Sheryl Sandberg kind of coming back after, um, Dave died and saying, you know, I'm sorry to all these single moms because I asked you to lean in and there's nowhere to lean um, and being honest about that. And I think that's that's huge for her to do um, and something that I think is fundamental to Alice's Table, which is that we are looking for women to have careers that suit their lifestyle. So whether that means they're working long hours and really building their business and growing, um, that's fantastic. Or they really want to focus on family or their charity work or other things um, and just want to put in, you know, a little bit of time here and there. That's totally fine, too. So we're about being supportive of the work that you're doing. You have the the public classes, right? And you also have yeah. private events. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the different private events that you've done and what you think the people um, can have uh, private events for? Private events are um, actually the bread and butter of our business. They're the vast majority of our business. And they are everything from corporate team building, client entertaining. Um, we do lots of charity events um, down to bachelorette parties, bridal showers, birthday parties. We do Tuesday wine club nights. I mean, it really <laughs> is a very wide range. Uh, and you have now, you have flower delivery subscriptions, right? We do. So the subscriptions were kind of a short-term play for cash flow at the beginning of the business. Okay. Um, but those are not going to scale with the business. You'll see those kind of dropping off shortly. Okay. So as, as you scale the other part of the business, you'll... Yep. Yep. It was a great way for us to kind of start small mm -hmm. and get some recurring revenue into the business. Um, I am very conservative with how we spend our money and what we spend money on. So I think it was a great way for us to build cash flow right from the beginning mm -hmm. and ramp with that cash flow, but it'll um, be gone soon. Okay. Yeah. What led you to the decision to scale the business to a national event host model? So it was always the plan. Okay. Um, it was certainly the plan to really 
trial this model with myself and to go out and teach classes, try and build our awareness around events, and then all while building the platform that allows women to to launch their businesses. So the goal kind of started as what can we do that allows people to have flexible careers, that allows them to be entrepreneurs kind of within this system um, and build from there. Mm -hmm. So it built into a flower arranging kind of events business. Um, you know, so scaling with event hosts is just the natural progression of growth. Okay. Um, but obviously we're still working out how that, that growth works. Um, we're in three states now and kind of how we move across the country, just like many other startups where they're like, do we need community managers or do we, you know, are we fine managing from headquarters and, and those kind of conversations, um, are certainly where we are as a company right now, mm -hmm. but scaling with hosts was definitely um, the play. It also makes the company um, exponentially more viable as a scaling business, kind of through time. So we can we can scale much more rapidly if we have kind of enclaves of people that are that are being creative and and marketing themselves within small communities. Now, at your events, people also learn a different cocktail each time, right? Sometimes. So Sometimes. not always. Mostly at the restaurants they do. Okay. Um, because everything should be paired with a cocktail pretty yes. much if it's fun and, you know, people are going for girls' night out. But we do lots of corporate events and other events in homes and things that don't necessarily pair with cocktails. Okay. So that's what? just a fun added perk. What is it about the flowers and cocktails that go so well together? Well, but they both work off of recipes. So when they both work off of recipes, I think that's, you know, there are a lot of parallels there, but also it just makes it a fun girls night out. And I think that's what people are coming out for. They want something different than just going to the bar and, you know, drinking with their friends. They want an activity. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of coupling those together, which makes it different. What are, what are your three tips for flower arranging? Have well, you gotta come to three, three top no. tips. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think there are a lot of tips, but some of the top three is flowers should go in warm water or room temperature water, never cold water, which is a common misconception. Um, always cut at a 45 degree angle because we increase surface area, get them to drink more. Okay. Um, and then the final thing that we encourage a lot is for you to actually talk to the florist or the person behind the counter at the grocery store about the flowers. Um, asking what's fresh, what's not fresh um, is a great thing to do. You know, you don't need to be afraid to ask questions. It's completely reasonable. Like, hey, when did these come in? Is it last week? Because I don't want them then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so just encouraging people to ask questions. You mentioned once that it's sometimes a challenge for you to keep your emotions out of your business. How do you go about that? And how do you recognize when you're letting your emotions take over so that you can reel them in? I think that for me, it's definitely an emotional thing. I think anyone that gets this far into a business is completely emotionally attached, right? It's mm -hmm. what gets you up at three in the morning to um, get on a ferry to go to Nantucket to throw an event. I mean, you've got to be a little nuts um, and emotionally involved in it. So I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing, um, but there are strategic and financial decisions that have to be made that are completely not emotional. And for me, it's about laying out strategic goals for the business um, and metrics for those successes. So if I can lay out a strategy and I can lay out goals and success metrics, I can make decisions that feel more black and white. Um, okay. so, and that, that feel necessary, you know, if you can point to, unfortunately, this decision has to be made because we have a goal of hitting, you know, X number of hosts by next year and we're just not going to get there. Or, mm -hmm. um, there's so many decisions every day that have to be made that are critical decisions in a startup of this size and at this stage of growth, um, that I think having goals and metrics in place is the only way you can do it. So it's like if if this isn't going to allow us to hit this goal or if it will allow us to hit this goal, then that's how you make those different decisions? Absolutely. I think that one of the things that we look at is, you know, particularly when you're making financial decisions, it's like the easiest, right? You say, this is the budget we have and that's inside or that's outside of the budget or we're not growing at that rate, so we can't afford that or we're growing way outside of what we expected and now we have more budget or we need more capital in order to achieve these goals because the goals are are growing outside of the bounds of our, our mm -hmm. financial ability. Whatever those things are, um, when you're talking in the financial realm, I think it 
numbers talk. Um, it's when you're talking more about like marketing decisions or sales decisions, those types of things where you can't point to an exact number. Yeah. I think it becomes increasingly important to decide what your metric of success is and then build towards that. Um, and say, Hey, we said that if our, you know, Facebook following wasn't growing by this percentage, we would invest less resources towards it. You know, we've invested 80% of our time for the past three weeks. It's not growing at that rate, you know, fish or cut bait. So, um, those, but those are all decisions that startups have to go through. And I think one of the important things for me is that having been in a couple startups before this, making quick decisions and saying, this is working, this isn't working, this is working, this isn't working, um, and being cutthroat in some ways about those decisions is important um, because there's too much on your plate to not be cutthroat about certain things. What has been the hardest decision so far for you to make? The hardest decision? There's some people that I think um, weren't the right fits um, that you know, were difficult decisions, but the right decisions mm -hmm. along the way. Um, having a core team that really makes sense and is passionate about what you're doing is very important to me. Today, you're flower focused. Yes. Right? What else do you have in store for the future? You'll just have to wait and see. Um, <laughs> we definitely are flower focused for now, and we're committed to um, moving geographically with flowers. Mm -hmm. um, we want to move across the country kind of with a streamlined brand. Um, but then we certainly will go more into the lifestyle segments, um, other lifestyle segments like interior design or cooking, other things okay. that can be taught in the same way. Yep. Um, and we've built our platform in a way that it's kind of a plug and play system. So you can plug in whatever the module of training is and the module of event throughout the system. Uh, you just talked about hiring and then you've written about it in the past as well about hiring yep. at a startup. So can you talk about what's most important to you when hiring? Yeah, I think it goes back again um, to the team being passionate about what the mission is. My mom used to say to me, she said, you know, everyone, Alice, is showing up and volunteering for you, no matter how much you pay them. And that's something that's really stuck with me. It's like people are there dedicating brain power and long hours and um, a commitment to a company that some days is like soaring to the sky and other days it feels like, what the heck are we working for? And that's yeah. just the nature of the startup world. And so to get people that really understand the dream and believe in the dream um, is nearly impossible, but critical. Um, and it's why we take so long to hire people, because I think it's you have to have someone that believes in you as a founder and the company's mission. Yeah, you don't want someone that's just there for like the rocket ship ride part of it. You want someone that'll stay there right. if that rocket ship starts to crash. Well, and also I think there is a, and I wrote a little bit about this, there's a concept of, oh, I want to work for a startup mm -hmm. without really understanding what it means. And working for a startup is a unique experience. We are asking people to come down to a basement of a home, sit here, work 12 hours a day, believe in a dream that sometimes we're like, what the heck are we working for? <laughs> you know, there are a lot of pulls on people um, and they have to be resilient in ways that many other um, people don't have to be. And so hiring for that and allowing them to understand, um, the potential candidate to understand what it means to be a part of a startup that's such an early stage startup um, is important to me, you know, bringing people down to the basement and saying, hey, this could you work, work here? Yeah. yeah. Could you work here five days a week, 12 hours a day mm -hmm. at least, yeah. you know, and and would you still be excited about it? Um, I think the other thing is when you have a young startup like we are, I'm a young founder. Our team is young. Um, getting people that actually respect um respect you and see you as the leader and aren't just like, oh, I'll go, you know, take a ride at, at this startup that I think is going to do really well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I'm very senior somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so balancing that kind of seniority versus hungry is, is difficult. Yeah. It's like a balance between hiring someone that's hungry for it and someone that is extremely qualified for it. Right. right. It doesn't matter if they're qualified for it, but don't 
don't have that hunger and yep. drive. Yeah, and, and it's a delicate balance for sure because you don't want someone that's so green um, because to be totally honest – none of us have time to to train yeah. someone really um so to get someone so green is difficult um but way too experienced you're like uh you know you want to manage someone um one of the questions i love to ask is kind of give them a scenario of a task and see if the usually it's with managerial um, people that at other places have managed a bunch of people, but here they're kind of going to be the manager of themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's saying, you know, how would you handle this task? And if their first reaction is, well, I'd look to my team or, you know, well, I'd, you know, email the person in charge of marketing. And you're like, no, 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 that's you. <laughs> <laughs> you won't email anyone. Yeah, like, yeah. Do. Um, so just kind of feeling that out in the interview process is, is important. And okay. um, yeah. And then culture. Culture is important. If you could start over, I realize you're young at this point in terms yeah. of the, the company. Is there anything that you would do differently? I don't think so. Um, I'm really excited about where we are today and excited about our path um, to here. It's not to say that we haven't made mistakes. It's not to say um, I didn't order, you know, five pallets of boxes that I didn't need. Um, that did happen. <laughs> Custom boxes, they're wonderful. Um, just the wrong size. Um, but those things always happen. It's just to say that I think every experience has been a learning experience. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing to, to happen. Um, also, we're on a great path to success. So I can't, you know, can't knock it. What has been the largest driver of growth for you? People. I think the people that we have that work here really care about the business and they work every day to make sure that we hit our goals. Um, and so that's been our driver of growth. Um, I'd say the next big driver of growth that we're excited about is our event hosts. And we see them as a critical um, piece of our future. And to see how many women have reached out and are excited about the opportunity, whether they end up converting and becoming event hosts or whether they just are excited about the brand. Um, we've had over 150 women reach out to us in the first month to say wow. kind of like, you know, this is exciting. I want to be a part of it. Um, and whether we've screened them out or they've, they've kind of self-selected out, it's still been awesome to watch kind of word travel. How did they find out about you? Um, we've had a number of articles written, um, we are, you know, still doing more PR, so hopefully it, the word will spread more. Um, but predominantly through, we were written up in Britain Co. And that seemed to be a great place where um, lots of people are hanging out, interested in um, alternative careers. I want to move now into our rapid fire questions section. Yeah. So what is your favorite flower? Hydrangeas. I'm boring. What is your top tip to give people about flower care? Um, flower care, use plant food. It works. It's there for a reason. What's your top tip for men purchasing flowers? Buy them more. <laughs> <laughs> Every day is great. No. <laughs> what does it mean to you to live an inspired life? Um, for me, it means waking up every day and loving what I do. What's your favorite cocktail? Moscow Mule. Oh, it's my favorite too. It's amazing. <laughs> Can't What's go wrong. <laughs> What's another startup in Boston you're most excited about? Um, I'm excited about a startup called Fans Call right now, um, which has built a mobile app that interacts with pro baseball. Okay. Um, and it's kind of a new and different rather than betting, um, more interactive. So. Okay. You're a baseball fan? I am not really a baseball fan, but this makes baseball more tolerable. <laughs> <laughs> What's something about you that most people don't know? I guess that waking up at 5 a.m. is not a unique thing to my startup career. It is, has always been that way. My roommate actually from college wrote, I asked her, um, <laughs> what would my startup, it was a startup, you know, kind of interview thing. And it said, what would your college roommate say about you? And I sent it to her and she said that she was always nuts. I was like, thanks. <laughs> and woke up at 6 a.m. to go work out. <laughs> so what do you do in the morning when you wake up? Come to work. Right at 5 a.m.? Uh, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Do you have I any... used to work out first and then come to work, but now it's just, you know, cut to the chase. Mm. Just get right in there. Get to it. Yeah. Do you have any favorite blogs or books? I really like Ben Horowitz's The Hard Thing About Hard Things. Yeah, that's it's a great book. So much. Yeah. I know. Yeah. You know, it just, 
It hits the nail on the head. It's really good. He it just is. cuts right to it. He does. And he doesn't kind of give you any of the fluffy, you know, you'll be fine. It's like, you know what? You either are cut through it and you'll get through it or you won't. Yep. So, you know, do it or don't. What advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? I think to worry less about career stepping stones, that it kind of works out as you go. Mm -hmm. um, you'll figure it out. So. Did you worry in, in the beginning of your career? Absolutely. Yeah. I definitely worried about, um, you know, is this the right move? Should I go here? What kind of job should I get first? Mm -hmm. um, but I'm glad I went directly into startups because I got that vision of um, how to start my own company and how to be a leader in that company. So I think I got lucky. Um, but I think so many people are so worried, like, I've got to get a management consulting first job, and then I've got to get a this first job. And I don't know, I think relaxing about it and just saying... Yeah, don't plan out every step. Yeah, exactly. No, I never would have thought that I would have started a company this early, but it's been fun. Just a few more questions here to close out. Yeah. Where can people find out more about Alice's Table? Alice'sTable.com. And where can people connect with you online? All over social minus Google Plus because who's there? <laughs> no one. <laughs> Do you have any parting thoughts, advice, or suggestions for the audience? I think just get started. Like, just go for it. That's the best thing. And you figure it out along the way. All right. We'll leave it there. Alice, yeah. thank you so much for coming on today. Thank you so much. Don't forget to enter into this week's book giveaway for The Power of Habit by subscribing and writing a review on iTunes. By subscribing, you'll get all of my new episodes automatically fresh onto your podcast app. So make sure to do so, and it really helps me out in the rankings and with acquiring new listeners. I really, really appreciate it. Remember, all show notes can be found at StartupBostonPodcast.com. And make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at StartupBossCast. That's Startup B-O-S Cast. Thank you for listening, and until next time, if you have any feedback, ideas for guests, or just want to say hi, you can reach me at nick at startupbostonpodcast.com. That's N-I-C at startupbostonpodcast.com. Cheers.